Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the February session of uh, the Neglected Books Publisher Spotlight. This month, we're focusing on uh, one of my, to me, model endeavors out there in the world of publishing, Tough Poets Press, and its publisher, Rick Schober, is here today. Um, and we're going to talk about one of the books that he's been responsible for bringing back, Myron Brennig's the flutter of an eyelid. Um, and uh, we're going to, I'm going to start with just a little talk about tough poets and uh, flutter, and then uh, ask Rick to uh, give us a little background on um, his somewhat unique approach to publishing, which has been a fabulous success, in my opinion, at least in terms of bringing books back into circulation and also uh, new activities. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead here and take a few moments to talk about uh, this activity. And so uh, we're talking about pro Tough Poets this month and this uh, book featuring, by the way, this is uh, one of the engravings that uh, an uh, artist named Linda Ward, who was quite popular in the uh, 20s and 30s, did. So each chapter in the book uh, it has a, a, a special illustration by Lynn Ward. Lynn Ward, by the way, uh, also uh, published a number of what we would today call graphic novels. So they're uh, novels uh, essentially without any any uh, uh, written text that are filled with uh, uh, illustrations, which are very uh, yeah <laughs> yeah. Uh, in Lynn Ward's, uh, those who are fans of Lynn Ward's will tend to you know. Uh, break for the sight of any of his work because it's quite striking. So Tough Poets Press is based in uh, Massachusetts and uh, a kind of a remarkable uh, activity uh, as it was featured in uh, Publishers Weekly about uh, four years ago, three and a half years ago, the One Man Press Resuscitating Forgotten Classics. Uh, although really from the very beginning, Rick was doing books that were not just forgotten, but uh, he was bringing wholly new works to, uh, to uh, back to print. And if you go to his website, it's, and this isn't, this isn't all the stuff that he's published, but uh, you can see it's a remarkable array of works, stuff from as far back as the turn of the 20th century, and brand new fiction that's being uh, written by people today, uh, men, women, uh, translations, really uh, an amazing uh, effort. And I can tell you, as somebody who has been following some of these authors, like Marvin Cohen there, Marvin Cohen has been, is uh, an interesting character, and, and Rick may be able to tell us some more about that, but he, he has written some really fantastic books. They're funny, they're philosophical, uh, they're wry, uh, and in a variety of formats, I guess you might say, a, a variety of prose styles. And I remember, you know, searching out Marvin Cohen books for years because he was kind of a private, you know, those who knew about Marvin Cohen went out for his books also, uh, Joseph McElroy, uh, Alexander Theroux, who is another cult favorite, those who love him, but Gil Orlovitz, uh, Gregory Corso, uh, Donald Newlove, just remarkable uh, array of work that, that he's been responsible for bringing back. Today, uh, we're going to look at Flutter of an Eyelid in particular, uh, but before we get into the book, I want to take a break and and ask Rick to uh, share some uh, some talk about how he came into this venture in the first place and uh, also uh, kind of how Tough, tough pro Poets works because I think a lot of folks will be surprised to hear how grassroots this effort is. Rick? Yes. So I, I started um, Tough Poets Press, I guess, six, seven years ago. Uh, I have a background in graphic design. I did a lot of uh, work for various corporate entities, mostly publication related, things like newsletters, brochures, and 
And I've always um, been a voracious reader. I, I collect a lot of uh, vintage paperbacks as a hobby. And I, I decided that why not start up a, a small press? I mean, it would combine, you know, the things that I really enjoy. And so, uh, of course, I'm not a writer. I don't have the uh, discipline or the, or the talent to actually write anything myself other than maybe an introduction to a book here and there. Uh, so I, I needed something to publish. And I had long been a fan of uh, the beat writers, uh, specifically Gregory Corso. And over the years, I'd collected a number of uh, publications where uh, there were interviews with the poet. And I figured that uh, I had enough for a book. So then that began the whole process of tracking down the copyright owners, getting permissions. Um, and once that was done, you know, I had the software to do the layout of the books sign the covers uh, for funding. I turned to Kickstarter and, um, you know, that was successful. And, you know, 50 plus books later, um, <laughs> I haven't spent a penny of my own out of money uh, on this publishing business. I haven't made a lot of money either, but, you know, I probably do better uh, bagging groceries if, if I add up all the time I've spent. And so uh, if, if you if you folks have a copy of of the book, just to 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 know literally how this is, this is this is crowdfunding in action. Um, is that, you know, in the acknowledgement, these are the folks who contributed and, and it's a great model, which is Rick figures out what it takes to, to publish this book uh, and break even. Uh, and I totally respect that because uh, that's not easy to do often in publishing. Uh, and so if, and he'll put out the Kickstarter notice, you can, if you contribute a, a set amount, you can get a, a copy of the book and your name uh, mentioned as one of the funders. Uh, there's been a number of his that I've contributed because I really admire what he's doing. There's a few times that I've contributed, even when I don't, I've got a copy of the book already, but I just respect what uh, he's doing that I want to support it. And uh, the diversity is one of the things I really like. So just to show you a few examples. So this is a book, Creamy and Delicious is uh, a collection of short stories, short fictions by a guy named Steve Katz. Steve Katz was uh, one of the kind of leaders of the experimental fiction movement in America, along with guys like Ronald Sukunik and uh, Walter Abish. Uh, they actually, he was one of the founders of a group called the Fiction Collection Collective back in the 70s that did some innovative work. They were really playing around with the style of short stories and the subject matter. So, uh, and in a, in a Steve Katz, there'll be photographs, there'll be, there'll be playing around with text, uh, a whole bunch of things like that. So this book, um, used copies of this book were going in like what probably 70, 70 to 100 bucks a copy. And, and quite, I mean, they, they weren't big sellers in the first place. Short story collections never are. Uh, so, but this is an example of what he's brought back. Here's new work, which is a, a writer named J Joyce Elbert. This is a collection of memoirs, uh, which had never been published before uh, that she brought back. They're kind of, uh, I would say, if you like the work of Eve Babbitts, that, which has been brought back by New York Review Books Classics, you would like this because it's travel, it's gossip, it's drinking, it's sex, it's wonderful, the 60s at its uh, swingingest, if you might say, but also self-reflective. I mean, that was not and, a lifestyle that didn't have a price. Yeah, and, and, and she talks talk a lot about, about writing too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and then another one, uh, occasionally, uh, this one I really admire. So this is a book um, I came across uh, this, you know, sometimes I stumble across and I know almost nothing about the book. I saw a mention of this book. So this is Peter Marchand's Give Me Your, uh, Give Me Your Answer Do. All I saw was a mention of somebody providing a comment on some book site saying, this is one of the books that most influenced me in my life. And I looked up a review of it, which is about a very quiet, the book is about a very quiet woman who fantasizes that she has this magnificent white horse in her life, that she has this guy, she talks about her life with the horse. And the horse is kind of a character in her life. And uh, the only copy I could find was from Australia. So I paid a fortune for this thing, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And thankfully, uh, because of Rick's effort, you can get this now <laughs> for far less than a than hundred plus bucks from Australia. Uh, and, you know, this, it, it, it's, I wouldn't say this is a great book, but it's a really good book. It's a fun book. Uh, this is a book that cries out for Hollywood to adapt it as a rom-com, oh, in my opinion, uh, with a little fantasy element. So that's, I mean, the, the, the range of things that he's brought back to us has been uh, just terrific. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about one of those examples, which I'll go back to uh, is Flutter of, the, of La Eyelid by Myron Brinig. One of Brinig's early uh, novels, Brinig was quite prolific. He published uh, in his lifetime 22 novels. Uh, although interestingly, he stopped. His last book was in 1958, and he didn't die. I didn't. Don't put it in those words. But <laughs> he died in 1991. So he had, uh, you know, three decades where he didn't publish, whether or not he was still writing. Uh, which is a, a bit of a. I don't know if Rick, you know anything more about what the story behind that is. No. Uh, uh Biographical in information is pretty uh, scarce. Sketchy. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, his biggest success in the 30s was his novel, The Sisters, which was another the, uh, one of his books that drew upon his, his uh, youth, his, uh, his raising uh, in Butte, Montana. And Butte at, the, at that time was a very active mining town. There was both a lot of money and a lot of poverty. Uh, in Butte, and a lot of politics and economic forces at play. Uh, that was a time when it was widely considered that basically Anaconda and Butte, the mining companies in those two cities, uh, which are in, in sight, you can see Anaconda from Butte. So it's uh, that basically they ran the state, uh, that it was basically big money running uh, Montana, a lot of corruption. And then, so yeah, there was a lot of silence when he died in 94. This, this is what, so this is what the Butte paper had to say about it. Not much, uh, considering that he uh, had brought such uh, attention to Butte with his early novels. Uh, soon after that, uh, there was a, this is a piece that appeared on my local paper here, Missoula, Missoulian, about the fact that his all of his books, when he died in 91, all of his books were out of print. Uh, there was a professor at the University of Montana here, Earl Gantz, who uh, got involved and got interested in them, in, in uh, printing, ended up not writing a biography or helping any of the books get reissued, but he wrote his own novel, <laughs> almost like a version of Flutter of the Eyelid. So I think it's called the Taos Chaos Game or something like that. Uh, which is about a after Burning was in Los Angeles, he spent some time in Taos, New Mexico, around Mabel Dodge Lewin and the kind of artsy community that formed in Taos in the third twenties and thirties. So this book was first published in 1933, and there you can see the fabulous cover from uh, Lind Ward, and it. Got some attention mainly because in those days, a guy named Bruce Catton, who became more famous for his Civil War histories, uh, was a syndicated book reviewer. 
hard to believe that there was such a thing uh, in today's world. But uh, yes, many newspapers published Bruce Catton's book review column, and he was pretty positive about it. He said it would have certainly it certainly was an entertaining novel, uh, and it got into some. It didn't get into a lot of the major national magazines, although uh, it did get into New York, uh, the New York New Republic, and and this will kind of give you. There were a lot of kind of negative, disparaging reviews about it. So here you get a taste of one of those. It's bad because of it's all vulgar virtuosity. He meant to satirize his sex drunk and art drunk characters as he must have meant he failed for he himself tumbled, toppled plump into the midst of them. He provides no feeling of being apart from what he writes about. His whole book is lush, feverish and pretentious, which some of us would say is, mm, OK, I'm interested. That, that's no. intriguing me. <laughs> I have to mention this one last review, which was in Time Magazine, simply because I love this opening line. If, if Tiffany Thayer were a great deal better writer, this is the kind of book he might write. I don't know if any of you have ever read anything by Tiffany Thayer. He, he is an interesting writer. He, I think he got, he was somehow managed to get books published as he as the ink was still drying on his manuscripts and so there there not much editing going on he kind of just lets the words flow his stories are bizarre crazy out of control uh scandalous and all sorts of stuff they're complete garbage to be honest but fun fun books to read particularly if you like the spirit of the 1930s so i just thought that was a, a funny comparison there uh, and the last thing before I kick off is to, to mention that if you if you like these discussions, we have our next one will be on, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the 30th of March, I will correct that. Uh, we're going to be talking to Eland uh, um, Publishing, which primarily focuses on travel related books. And so uh, Barnaby Rogerson, the publisher, has selected this book, uh, Stambul Sketches, uh, Encounters in Old Istanbul, written by John Freely, and we'll be talking about that, uh, which is, if you love Istanbul, which is a fascinating exotic city uh, and has got one of the richest histories on, on the face of the planet, uh, this is a terrific book. But with that, I want to open it up and uh, go back and, and invite Rick to talk about a little bit by about um, how you came up, uh, what what uh, inspired you and interested you in, in Flutter of an Eyelid and, and uh, what kind of response the book has gotten since it was released? Well, it's, it has been one of the best sellers, you know, from Tough Poets Press, which isn't really saying much, but it consistently, you know, sells a few copies, maybe, a dozen or two every month. Um, the Kickstarter was one of the more successful ones. I think there were like, uh, I don't know, take a look, at least a couple hundred backers for this one. Um, I first heard about the book uh, from a gentleman named Jack Mearns, who is a professor of uh, psychology at UC something in California. Uh, I had, uh, well, he, he's the executor of the literary, literary estate of John Sanford, whose uh, first book, The Water Wheel, I reissued. Uh, it was actually written under his birth name, Julian Shapiro, but uh, John Sanford later took as his pseudonym the name of the uh, protagonist in that novel. And we've been... Jack Mearns and I have been exchanging emails for the last few years, just, you know, recommending various books to each other, you know. And he had uh, suggested The Flutter of an Eyelid. He had not read it, but he had heard interesting things about it. So I was able to, uh, you know, track down a copy through my uh, local public library. 
Really? And uh, I read it. I enjoyed it. I mean, that's that's to me a good book is an entertaining book, and this this one was just very entertaining. And it, I, it was funny. I loved all the subplots. Uh, the characterizations were great. Um, tracking down uh, the estate of uh, Lind Ward to get permission to reuse the uh, woodcuts was a little more difficult. Uh, that took a couple of months, but finally I found his uh, two daughters uh, and, you know, they, of course, requested a little bit of compensation uh, mm -hmm. to reuse the images, but I, I think they add a lot to the novel itself. Absolutely, absolutely. It, have there been, can you, uh, are there any prospects that you're looking at that um, when you're going after, I mean, in terms of tracking, one of the biggest challenges is tracking down who holds the rights and, and getting them to sign up to an agreement. Are there any uh, properties that you're looking at that you're still searching uh, for? Um, there is one that I've been trying to get permission to reissue for like four or five years. And that's a translation uh, by a Japanese woman author, uh, Oh man, I can't remember her name. It'll come to me. But the book is uh, The Adventures of Sumiyakist Q. And it's this brilliant dystopian novel. Uh, she put out a collection of short stories that was translated into English. Um, the Woman with the Floating Head, something like that. Um, but, you know, because she is, uh, you know, she died young. Uh, her husband, who was an American, is no longer alive. They, they didn't have any children. Uh, I did find some, um, like, some attorney in Japan who had something to do with the rights to her estate. But, you know, the, the very, uh, they're not very responsive. But that, that's a great book. If, if you can find it, um, copies are extremely scarce. I mean, I locked out and got one for about $30. Uh, but if you like that, you know, kind of very strange dystopian fiction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wanna start just by, uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to read uh, a little passage from the flutter, which uh, to me, it's kind of an example of what you see with with Brinning in this book. I and again, we I haven't read any of those books, but I, I have a feeling that it's it's not. You know, I think this book may be exceptional in terms of just the fluidity of his language and how much he plays with it. So this this is about. Uh, this is in a chapter called The Tempest. So this is where his, his character, uh, Saul Miser, is that right? Yeah, Mosier. Um, Mosier. Who is based on, according to uh, Barry Alfonso, who is a kind of a, a student of California history uh, and uh, culture, uh, says that this is probably based on a, a real life character named Jake Zeitlin, who opened a quite influential bookstore in Westwood in Hollywood uh, that was kind of the center of uh, a lot of kind of counterculture and, and, and the bohemian world of Hollywood. There was a strip along uh, Sunset Strip with a very interesting point that a lot of kind of alternative culture, a lot of LGBTQ uh, lives and uh, activities, uh, a lot of nightclubs where gays could gather, were located around the area where uh, Jake Zeitlin's book was too. And it turns out that the reason that kind of all happened is that that little stretch of about maybe 10, 15 blocks fell outside the Los Angeles city limits. So the <laughs> vice cops <laughs> could, 
couldn't operate there. Uh, so, so they could kind of get away and less riskily gather. Uh, and so, uh, but, but uh, I mean, to me, this is, is one of the wonderful things. I mean, this, this is a book full of idealists. Uh, of different uh, types. And, and Saul Mosier is off on this idealist quest where he's decided to walk out of his house and just kind of experience life in the raw, which he quickly finds has some downsides like hunger and thirst. And so he wanders along uh, to this place where a, a guy agrees to feed him if he digs a hole. And he says, uh, at one point he says, I seek a higher plane, not a lower, said Saul, the while he lifted himself out of the hole wearily. He attacked the bacon with fiendish hunger and swallowed the coffee in several gulps. Immediately, the sun was less hot, the man more picturesque, the hole less offensive. As a matter of fact, said Saul, addressing the man, I could go home right now and, quite, and live quite comfortably. I'm pretty well fixed. It isn't necessarily it isn't necessary for me to dig latrines in order to eat. My wife and I have a lovely house, an exquisite lavatory. But you know, now that I've helped dig a hole, my heart goes out to you, my good man, my sympathy. It can't be very pleasant for you to dig a hole without thinking of the flowing lines, the plays of Shakespeare's, the truths, truths of Ibsen. What do you think about when you dig a hole anyway? I'd be interested in knowing. Me? Well, I can't say I think about much of anything except will it be finished and will the bee hole be big enough? <laughs> and the book is full of these, these kind of, uh, it's what I, one of the things I like about this book, and I'd be interested to hear other folks' reactions, is that uh, Brennig, this is a case where Brennig lets himself go, you know, as his pen will and kind of follows it. And it, you know, the editors didn't throw it out like many editors today would probably throw these things out as, as uh, kind of overflowing. But this was the age of Thomas Wolfe, and editors tended to uh, let their writers have their head. So, uh, I mean, that's that's one of the things I I, I think is is uh, quite entertaining about this book. And I'd be interested to hear what other readers' uh, reactions are. Did anybody dislike the book if you've read it? No. No, I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed okay. it. A lot. I, I thought I thought it was a, a good mixture. If I if I remember correctly, there was some mythology in it too, and and a lot of surreal stuff. Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah. Well, there's 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 actually a lot going on. Almost right. too much. Right. Um, uh, I mean, there is, there's a murder. I mean, there's a, actually, there's a lot of death in this book. So, uh, yeah, we have a couple of poisonings. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have the mythological connections between kind of the Greek characters of the, uh, the, you know, the nude bathing and dancing on the beach uh, yeah. near Alta Vista, which is like Palos Verdes uh, in um, the LA area. Uh, you've got the, uh, one of the things that I found almost like this is the sort of thing an editor would absolutely kill is the whole business about Lad Green Gable, who's this artist, who who actually is never in Southern California until like the last instant where he suddenly appears uh, to try to you know rescue somebody, uh, and he wonders he he starts wandering up the coast, then he continues into Canada through the United States, hitting everywhere, and then he shows up in a monastery in France in search of himself. Uh, and then suddenly, miraculously, is back in California when the trial is going on, and the and the whole state falls into the water. <laughs> so th this would be a tough one to 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 film, I think. Yeah, <laughs> second comings. Also, the death. I mean, you could say that the. Uh, 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 Angela Flower, who is 
definitely based on uh, the religious figure, Amy Semple McPherson, who uh, in the days before television, she, I mean, she would have been a television evangelist if television existed. She did a lot of work on radio. She had a temple down in LA. And I think, I think the floor of four square gospel temple still exists, doesn't it? In, uh, I don't know if it's still like faithful to her vision, whichever, whatever her vision was. Um, but yeah, she was a charismatic uh, Christian figure. And, you know, one could claim when she cultivates this Seaman Milton as a, as a, as the Jesus-like figure and then convinces him to try to walk on water uh, and, and then he drowns that, that that's probably also, we could put that in the murder category, uh, in the murder <laughs> column, uh, in this book. He's one of the casualties, uh, uh, so California is not a benign lifestyle in, in Mal Malcolm Brink, Myron Browning's uh, uh, viewpoint, that's for sure. Mm. Um, I, I have to admit that I didn't like the novel. So, <laughs> and I'm very interested in, um, it, it's uh, kind of like when things don't work, sometimes it's more interesting to me than when I'm just completely bowled over and agape at, at uh, the skill. So, um, so uh and what what didn't you like about the novel um i i felt um i mean i hate this expression but i felt i was being shown things and and told what they were rather than um and i know that's a part of the satire thing is that you 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 sort of take stereotypes and you you know embellish them to the point where they're kind of laughable but i didn't find the stereotypes very interesting um i found it um and i i mean maybe this is just woke me um in my eighth decade but i um the references the literary references all seem kind of superficial it seemed like well i could have ticked off all those writers and it's sort of the same cadre of dead white males and nothing really aware of anything outside of western european thing i mean some hindu and buddhist stuff but it was all and well i was talking earlier before we started that this reminded me a lot of um diane johnson's early novels which were set in southern california uh in the 60s and 70s and um and by comparison, she's, she's lambasting the same sort of people, right? As we were saying before, it's never, Southern California has plenty of places where this is still going on and has always gone on. But from her writing, I could, I could see in a room what the people were seeing about each other and how they were reacting. This one, I felt like they were kind of cardboard to me. Um, representations, but not human. I think that's a fair criticism. Yeah, there's, there's sort of a cartoon quality to the characters in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, the second, the last third um, really moved along and, and that's where all the disasters started to happen and, and taking wonderful schadenfreude, it's, you know, what's going to happen to these people and, um, and obviously a devilish imagination on the walking in the water and, and then dropping to the bottom of the ocean and stuff like that. Um, so um, I, I wonder if in a way, it almost felt like he was warming up that maybe not to edit the earlier stuff, but to let him take, it seemed like it just gained so much energy in the last third. And I just wonder um, given how many different personas he probably had to maintain in his society starting in Butte and then going on that maybe there's also just a, a bunch of layers of protective layers that finally he shed and really went to what he wanted to be talking about but that's you know I'm not sure but I I'm glad I read it and um, I'm really glad we're talking about it because I never um, would have heard about this and it's a it's certainly t a touching on many things that we all still think about a lot so so thank yeah, you absolutely but anybody who's lived in California can, you know, this book <laughs> resonates on many different levels because there are so many aspects of the kind of weirdness that goes on in Southern California, even even today. I mean, even Northern when California. I was living in LA, it wasn't it wasn't uh, Amy Semple McPherson. It was, you know, 
Dr. Gene yeah. Scott, who and, and who uh, would have to be on at all hours of the day, ranting uh, uh, in in what I don't know how he operated, but uh, he was he was quite a character. Yeah. <laughs> There's a great uh, novel uh, called California's Over. Have you ever? Read that. No, that's a new one on me. Yeah, it's based in Bolinas, and it's basically um, the basketball diaries guy when he lived there. It's a it's a roman a clay uh, uh, with that set uh, before Francis McDermott moved there. But um, but again, this is a recurring theme, and I'm I'm really glad to see it set. This also reminded me a little bit of Glenway Westcott and um, his novel The Grandmothers, and oh. the fact that he too. Um, had some success and then didn't write for another 30 years um, and died in 87, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I highly recommend that. I think that's a really fascinating book. Oh, um, that's so funny you mentioned the grandmothers. I'll tell you my yeah. story. I All right. wanted to take it out of the Queens Public Library where I live in part of New York City. They have uh -huh. a huge, huge, huge thing. So I ended up requesting the grandmothers. I still had it. It was a first edition. It was about like that. The book looked like an accordion. <laughs> and to read it and enjoy it. I was so surprised that they had that there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know the book has been reissued. I read, you know, a number of his other books. But yeah. uh, this one had yeah. you say the grandmothers. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm lucky. I, I have a UC. Um, I'm a retired from UC, um, and so I have a retiree library card. Uh -huh. I can get you want first edition? Just give me a <laughs> ring. I can get you anything. <laughs> and the lot, and I love to look at the little checkout dates, and you'll see 1931. 1976, you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> There's a comment from uh, James Kelly that uh, I, I'm sure others picked up on this, but the the cat character's name of Caslin, of course, uh, is a typeface. Um, oh. And uh, whether or not that was intended uh, by uh, by Brennig as a reference in one way or another about the the literary nature of that uh, of the writer Caslin Roanoke, um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did like the whole idea of the the sort of sorcerer's apprentice in reverse, right? That the that the typewriter is running his life, and he can't right. it won't let him go, and and. Um, Again, you know, I, I think there's some wonderful imagination going on, and sometimes people have imagination, and the, the words don't always work as well. And sometimes they have really nice words, but they don't have that much to imagine. So, but I did love that concept. I think that's, you know, wonderful. Yeah, in, well, in, a, re in retrospect, I probably should have used Castellan for the typeface for the book. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the collector's edition. <laughs> but I, I did like those Pirandellian sort of twists throughout where you're never quite sure who's in charge, him or the characters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. he sort of anguishes over the fact he's going to bring them to an end or whatever. And um, I, I just thought it, it must be a straight borrowing from Pirandello, surely. But, you know, he's experimenting yeah. with the literariness of writing, which is why I thought he was named Caslon after all. And Roanoke is just Eastern America, isn't it? Is Virginia. It Virginia. Is lost, well, actually, it's two lost things. There colony, is Roanoke as a living, Roanoke. active city, but it's also the colony that Sir Walter Raleigh founded yeah. where they all mysteriously disappeared. Yeah. Um, hmm. or wow. I just What's that? A, I just saw a program on that, and there was one word that was written in a cro croaton. Yeah, croaton. Yeah, right. Yes. yes. I, one of the things I found about this book, and I took it in the period that it was, was it, it had a certain quality of surrealism to it. I took it almost as a surrealistic experience. Well, certainly, I would say there's some uh, hints of uh, like Louis Ergon's uh, Par uh, Paris Peasant. Um, you know, the kind of characters entering into um, uh, strange situation. Pirandello was playing around with that. The writer writing about what 
uh, creating reality by writing it. It's definitely a strong element here uh, where Caslin finds himself, you know, essentially often wondering what's looking essentially what he's written and then looking out the window, so to speak, and seeing that it's happening and wondering if he's the one uh, causing it. Also a lot of play with drugs, uh, you know, so opium is a factor. This uh, interesting wine called Doracell that uh, is used that it's a poison that takes 72 hours to take effect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love the countdown. <laughs> or, or 30 days is going to happen. This is 15th day. <laughs> yeah. There are also some uh, kind of flights of um, like the whole uh, concerto uh, that the uh, Jack character, the, the, the lesbian uh, composer, uh, where he just kind <laughs> of there's such a long, I highlighted in, in my copy of it, where he just goes on and on about describing what's in this concerto that she's where it takes, it takes the listener through the United States and all of these scenes. You have to, you know, you have, you have to wonder, is that's a remarkable piece of music uh, to have all of that in it. Uh, although at the end, you know, everyone kind of goes, well, that was interesting, which, you know, which is a classic Midwest compliment. <laughs> I, I had been um, interested in this book. I had read it before, you know, the discussion came up uh, last year. There was a, a book about, uh, I think it was a list of about 50 uh, pre-Stonewall gay and lesbian books or gay and lesbian characters that, that was good. And I found this book in it. And then I said, oh my God, it's been reissued. Thank you very much. So I went and I got a copy on Amazon and now we're discussing it. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't find it a very strong LGBT book, but I, I, just, I just found the book was so unusual. I, I passed it along to a novelist friend, Christopher Bram. So I, I have to get his opinion on it. Let's see, but, but I had read, but I had read it last year. It was just you know very very good, very very good, and and very very unusual. But it didn't stay with me. Yeah, I I, I can get that. I mean, it's. I think I would have really loved this book when I was in my twenties, as because I <laughs> loved that kind of the over the top, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that was very much in the flavor of uh, you know. People like Robert Coover writing The Public Burning um, about the Rosenbergs uh, and uh, the Universal Baseball Association of, uh, you know, that kind of, let's just, the Americana comes out in great floodgates. Uh, and that's definitely, I mean, this, this is a book. I mean, this book would not have been written in another country. This is an American book. <laughs> in all of its... Uh, you know, the, it's it's classic over the topness, uh, which is one of the you know great and terrible things about our culture as an as a nation. Did anyone find that there were California references? I mean, if you're not someone who's lived in California, did you find that some of it just kind of went no, missing I, on it? Didn't yeah. hit its mark. I've lived my whole life in New York. Of course, I've traveled and I've, you know, read read widely, but I, I didn't find anything there that I couldn't, you know, associate with. We always think of California as the area, with all due respect, fruits and nuts is how we say, you know, we have the right. West of New York versus California. But no, it was a very entertaining read. Very. For me, I had to look up um, one or two writers and composers. There were a lot of references yes. to artists of the time and i in my ignorance i i hadn't heard of most of them mm -hmm. well somebody who lives in california um i found it kind of annoying when he started talking about the flora and fauna and the birds because <laughs> it's it's not what he experienced uh, first of all geraniums and ice plant seem to be everywhere he goes and i know in the 30s probably there were a lot of geraniums and ice plant but tweeting of sparrows and 
you know, all this stuff um, in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, birds do not sing in California. They get into the shade. But so <laughs> that's sort of, well, they do. I mean, yeah, you know. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and he, he just had these tropes and about the, you know, the sun making its trek across the sky. And yeah, it sets in the ocean, which took me like, 10 years to get used to having grown up on the East Coast. I still have to say, wait, which way is west? But um, so I, I found it kind of cursory. I found that he was just deploying, a, and I'm not sure he was really interested in other than the way it made him feel, you know, so mm -hmm. that, and that's fair. I'm not saying that he had to have the perfect, uh, but I was I was surprised at someone going to all into all that work to do stuff that wasn't really happening as much but maybe that's just the way california made him feel and so he just wrote it that way you know and that's fair too so yeah well remember that this was a time when california was being advertised like a garden of eden like it right. was you know, the the lush place that you would go the vast uh orange uh groves and the, uh, the sure. lifestyle uh and not paying attention to of course the the pervasive issue of, of water, which if you've ever seen the movie Chinatown, right. I mean, that, that has always been a subtext in LA was the fact that it's a, it is a town in the desert. Uh, right, right. It's not, uh, it's, it was never intended to support 3 million people or even a million, which was probably about the population when Brinning was visiting there. Um, and, and the other aspects of it that, uh, he doesn't really address so this. Is, I mean, this is this is a fringe group of people in this book. Right. Um, right. Um, you know, uh, in fact, I, I think it's the character Sylvia is asked about, you know, what she thinks about Hollywood. And she kind of says, Hollywood, what's Hollywood? I've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I Which, thought the descriptions um, were uneven, but at their, at their best, they were very connected and profitably idiosyncratic might might just have been the odd line towards the end when um daisy is dying um there's a line about i think it's her flesh thinning something like that um which is quite an extraordinary um observation i i i think i it felt to me very connected somehow Whereas other times the descriptions were flamboyant, but but less connected. And I also, at around the moment, the moment of just after Daisy's death, that um, I mean, there's actually a necrophiliac scene, which which um, the only other one I'd had experience of was Achilles having killed um, the Amazonian queen outside Troy. And that was committed out of lust, I felt. But this was actually a necrophiliac scene committed, necrophilia committed out of love. It, it, mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't repellent at all. I found it, for me, I found it actually extremely moving. Mm. Well, I think that, you know, if you look at Brinning's particularly like his Butte books are very family. It's about family dramas and multi-generational mm. families. And uh, I agree with you. I mean, that was a scene, you know, was written by someone who'd been in a room with somebody dying. You know, yes. it wasn't imaginative. It was uh, lived observation. One of the things I wanted to ask for reactions of, and 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 Rick certainly chime in if you want. To me, this this is a, you know, I as, as I think all of you know that you know I I have been chasing neglected books for for decades, and you know, one of the things that comes up often when I talk to folks about it, and and I even think about a lot when I'm when I'm writing about them, is that there are a lot of books that I think need to be brought back to print, not because they're masterpieces, but because mm -hmm. they're interesting, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. they're, they, they 
offer a gap uh, uh, they they to me it's often a matter of filling gaps in our literary understanding mm -hmm. of what's going on uh it, during a time and you know i i don't think this is a great book but i think it's a fascinating book i certainly enjoyed reading it even when i thought somebody should have taken a, a blue pencil a really thick one through some some <laughs> passages that were just going nowhere or right, right. Or written uh but you know i i, I don't I mean, I mean i've written you know nathaniel west's the day of the locust is the one that's going to be most known as mm -hmm. the hollywood novel from this period i enjoyed this far more as a read than the day of the locust to be honest. yeah yeah. And so I'm just interested in other folks' reaction. I mean, this here's this book brought back to print. Uh, I mean, if you thought it was a masterpiece, speak speak up. But uh, you know, where do you think these these kind of books fit in the scheme of of one's reading and our one's understanding of of literature and, and literature of our of of a particular period? I thought it was a really interesting, sorry, I'm on him, yeah. I thought it was a really interesting sort of reflection of modernism and, um, the, you know, with um, an awful lot of European influences. I know you said it's the, the book could only be written in the States, but he seem, seems to have sort of absorbed a lot of avant-garde from Europe and is applying it badly in some places and pretty well in others. And I, I just wondered... Does anybody know if he actually travelled in Europe or was he in any mainstream sort of culture? I mean, for a boy from Boot, he, he seems to have come quite a long way. I believe, from what I know of his biography, at the time he had written this, he had never left the United States, maybe Canada, but no, I don't think he'd, he, he hadn't done his cruise to, uh, in his year in Paris, as many of them had done in the 20s. He probably didn't have enough money to to do that until he'd gotten a few books under his belt. Yeah, and, and Lad does that, doesn't he, for him? So, um, you know, when he goes on his peregrinations. So um, I, th I think maybe he, I don't know, maybe he writes pretty well about other, other places that he's never visited then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he would have certainly. Well, I, was, I was grateful that you, gone, you, you know you lived suggested. in France because there was that circulation going on uh, mm. a lot. Yeah, well, the the exchange rate was in the favor of Americans, so yeah. I mean, that's why Fitzgerald and many other who went to France was it was so darn cheap to live there um, and mm. get some cosmopolitan experience at the same time. Oh yeah, it's all good stuff. Well, I was, I, I was grateful that you suggested the book and I read it because I wouldn't ordinarily have come across it, I don't think. And the, the artwork in it is extraordinary as well. I thought it was lovely. And um, well, I have this, this, I'm letting, I'm asking each publisher to suggest the book. So this was Rick's suggestion. Mm. And it was a great one. Uh, and mm. I think all the publishers have been picking uh, good titles uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, Considering the the wealth of titles uh, that you could pick, for, why why did you do, why did you pick this one in particular, Rick? Well, I I think like many people have said, it was just a very entertaining book, um, and I think people with different um, preferences and in, in you know reading. There's there's something for everyone in in this book, I, I guess. Whether you mm -hmm. like you know mystery or what surrealism, um, just you know flowery writing, you know, it's it's got a little bit of everything. For for me, I found it very the writing very fluid. In other words, I never even though some of it was definitely overwritten, it was tremendously readable. Every time I picked it up, I was, you know, two chapters into it before I put it down again. Um, and to me, that that's to write 
vivid prose that's compelling and reading that that's not an easy trick because there are a lot of there are a lot of writers i mean i can imagine this book coming from a, other writers where it would be you know 300 pages of struggle and turgidity so to speak if that's a, if that's a word i was struck by how um precise he was about not just the time when somebody would be poisoned, you know, hour by hour, but the pages. He said, yeah, I've got a hundred pages left. And I went, and I said, you're right. You do have a hundred pages left. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wait a minute, this is getting weird. <laughs> that, that's all part of the sort of literary nature of it, isn't it? And the continual fact that he's writing, isn't it? You know, that he, yeah, he's, yep. he's obviously got his plot and he, he's got his, his references to it. And I, I thought, you know, as I say, I really enjoyed that that part of it. And I, I did think it read well, too. And like you, Brad, I, I sort of every time I picked it up, I read several chapters without really being aware of the time going by. The, mm -hmm. the other thing I was grateful for was it's not sort of full of nasty phrases of its time. I mean, you can quarrel a bit about the portrayal of soul, say, and sort of Jewishness. But, you know, a lot of other novels that you read from the 20s and 30s, they've, they've got the N-word in them, and they've got references to Jews and all, oh, stuff that just puts you off straight yeah. away. And, yeah. and this seems a very sort of, um, I don't know what the right word is, but almost noble in its sentiments to me. I don't know if that's the, right, even word. The, what the right word. The, is clean anyway. Yeah. I mean, even the depiction of uh, the, the gay couple, um, Dashe and Antonio, it's realistic and and sympathetic. It's not like campy like so many other novels yeah. of that era would have portrayed that type of relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Really I mean, that's that's one thing that's striking. I mean, Brinig was gay, but he was pretty low profile uh, with his uh, and he just takes them as they are, you know. They're, that's they are from the from moment they they appear we all know they're gay we know they're a couple it's not uh Good there, there's no campiness to it yeah yeah um the the character of Saul is um intriguing when you realize that Brinning himself was Jewish um uh, and yet it is, yeah, it, it is sort of a, is it a uh, uh, sort of a masochistic view of Jewishness. Mm -hmm. I, I think one would have to read his, his Butte novels have, are all uh, centered on Jewish characters and Jewish, uh, oh. Jewish family life in the context of what was going on in Montana at that time. And um I mean, it could be, it could be Jewish in the same way that you know, Catskill comics, stand-up comics make fun of Jewishness. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, when it it is a little bit off-putting, I guess I would say, is that how much he's uh, particularly he he holds Saul up to ridicule in that you know that long journey out to experience life as it's lived. Uh, he is, he's holding him out up to be quite a figure of ridicule. Whereas the real character, Jake Zeitlin was, you know, one of the, you know, focal points, the nexus uh, of, of LA uh, kind of, I wouldn't say counterculture, but bohemian culture, uh, arts and dance and music and, and writing. Uh, people went to Jake Zeitlin's uh, uh, bookstore to to find out what was good to read and what they should read, and and uh, he was a a taste setter, in fact. I'll tell you the other thing I like, which is the ending, and this sort of long trend of novels in which California or chunks of it are destroyed, whether it's by nuclear bombs or earthquake or falling into the ocean or whatever because then um, what did i read recently was it am holmes is, is it one of her books where there's a great blocked sewer or something that then spews half of 
one of the counties out into the ocean at the end and sort you've of got me but unless somebody else happens to know that but it's very likely yeah there's there's sort of a self-destructiveness that people associate with california i think part of it if you live in california particularly southern california you know a regular feature are as, as phyllis mentioned the the wildfires in the hills that destroy housing mm -hmm. also the mudslides the people people build houses where they probably shouldn't build houses uh southern california is an earthquake zone i lived in uh, in the la area and i can remember driving down the street and looking up and wondering why the telephone wires were going back and forth like that and realizing oh that's we're having an earthquake so uh, yeah, it's uh, for for a place that has so much going on, uh, it's often living at the edge of peril. I guess you might say. Uh, yes, my my daughter had a scholarship at the Huntingdon for a month, and this was too good a chance to miss, so we went to visit. And I was driving around and thinking, the temperature outside is one hundred and sixteen degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Unheard of. Although after this last summer in Europe, I'm not so sure now. <laughs> Um, one last thing about um, his playing with uh, authorship and everything, and we uh, touched on this, but I did love how when he realized, when he thought, oh gosh, I can't, I don't want to kill these people by finishing the novel, but he said, but I can't bring the ones I've killed back to life. And it's almost like <laughs> a total joke on the whole idea of authors creating characters that oh, I, I killed a real person and I can't change that from my writing and my writing, I just thought it was a very nice twist, a, a little a phenomenological uh, <laughs> play there, but. Right. Well, okay, I'll, uh, I think we'll wrap it up since we've pa passed the hour point. If there's uh, anyone has any further question or comment they wanna make, uh, we'll leave it open here. If not, I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, dialing in and uh, especially thanking Rick Scober for taking part and um, publishing a thoroughly entertaining book, uh, I think is the consensus of everybody who, who came in uh, today and, and an interesting book, a book that, that, that gives you things to think about and images to remember that I would not have had in my mind before I read this book. <laughs> That's, <laughs> and to me, that's a that's a plus. Any book that gives me things to think about months later uh, that I would never have thought about, it, I have to say, is a is a winner uh, by by all regards. So uh, next month will be on the thirtieth of March. We'll have Eland talking about Stamble sketches, uh, a very very different book because it is nonfiction. But if you've ever visited Turkey or the Middle East, it's such an entertaining uh, book. It's just so vivid uh, and you'll want to get on a plane and go there. But of course, he's talking about a scam, Istanbul, uh, Istanbul that no longer quite exists. It's, uh, if you've been to Istanbul in the last few years, it's, it's a megalopolis. Mm. So. Okay, take care, everyone, and thank you for thank joining you. us. Yeah, thank thank, you. You. thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.